Welcome back to chapter 11. In this particular lecture video, we're going to be talking about the single most important section of the chapter. And what that really means is this lecture video won't be all that long, but it has several different example problem videos associated with it. So this section is Archimedes' principle and the buoyant force. And so let's start by thinking about what buoyant force actually is. So if we imagine a small chunk of a fluid, we just kind of draw an imaginary line around a piece of fluid within the same surrounding fluid, we want to think about what forces are acting on that. All of the different um, edges of the line that we've drawn can act as surfaces, and the buoyant force is going to be, sorry, the pressure is going to be acting perpendicular to each of those different um, parts of the shape that we've drawn. Gravity is also acting, but all of those different pressure forces most of the um, force cancels out. There's equal amounts of left force and right force. And there's a little bit more up force than there is down because the bottom of the fluid is that higher pressure. If we think about the previous section, higher pressure below, lower pressure above. And so the overall effect of all of those different pressure arrows that we could draw is a single force that we can call the buoyant force. It's the same way that we can think of the force of gravity as a single force acting at the center of an object. The buoyant force we can think of as a single um, force acting at the center of that object. We will use BF to indicate the buoyant force. So let's imagine that that chunk of um, whatever we've drawn is no longer fluid, but is now a separate object entirely, an actual physical object. The weight of that object is mass times g. That's the same as what we've been thinking about weight this whole time. But the buoyant force is still pushing on it the same way it did when we were thinking about it as just an imaginary piece of the fluid. The pressure forces are pretending that that object is made of that same fluid and is pushing up on it as if it is that fluid. So let's think about what happens if this chunk is denser than the fluid has been placed in or lighter, um, less dense than the fluid has been placed in. Now think through these, and if you want to, you can try dumping stuff into um, a glass of water at home to make sure that it makes sense to you why each of these things happen. But I have a glass of water here. And so if we have an object that is denser than the fluid has been placed in, I just have a quarter here. If I drop the quarter into the water, if I put it into the middle and I let go, it just drops to the bottom, it will sink. The reason for that is the water is pushing up on it as if it is the density of water, but that means the buoyant force is less than the weight of the quarter itself. The quarter is heavier and that force of gravity is stronger, and so there's a net force downwards until it hits the bottom and now there's a normal force helping out. What happens if the chunk is less dense than the fluid? I have some rainbow mini marshmallows here. Um, I'll take a pink one and a green one. Uh, and if we have something that is less dense than water, it will float, okay? It will stay right at the top of the um, fluid, being partially submerged and getting marshmallow sugar all throughout the water, great. Um, and it will rise to the top, it will float. So we have things that sink and things that float. I wish I had something that was right at about the same density of water. Um, I don't easily available here at home. But what would happen is if we put that object that's roughly the same density as the water somewhere in the middle, it would pretty much just kind of float there. The forces would balance and it wouldn't move. It would stay where it was. And so what we have then, and um, those should be on the same slide, but that's okay. Uh, we have sinking things, we have rising things, and we have a situation where it could stay at the same spot. Now the buoyant force is equal to the weight of um, the imaginary chunk of fluid. And so the buoyant force is basically the fluid trying to hold itself up. It is the weight of what would have been fluid in that volume if we put it there. Now it's worth, worth making sure we understand what we mean by displaced fluid here. When we put an object into the water, it actually 
changes the height of the water. It displaces, it moves out of the way that fluid. So if we have an object, um, and I have this really awesome metal dragon that I'm going to dunk in the water here, the volume of the object is going to be the same as the volume of the water it replaces. So not an easy volume to calculate, but what we could do is we could just figure out where the height currently is, and then we slowly put him into the water, and then where the weight goes up to, or where the height goes up to. So I'll take him back out of the water, and we see that the height goes down a bit. And you can certainly try this with any objects that you have at home. Um, the bigger in volume the object, the more it will displace the water. And for the marshmallows, it's worth noting they're floating so that the amount that is under the water is the mass and um, volume of how much fluid is needed to balance that out. Because the forces are now balanced here. Uh, the fact that it rises doesn't mean it rises all the way out of the water, but it will sit with a certain amount under the, under the surface. Now, the key thing here is that when we have situations where gravity down and buoyant force up don't balance each other, then we can come up with a third force that will cause those things to be in balance so that the forces, um, the object is not moving and the forces can balance each other out. These are gonna look a lot like chapter four problems where the only big difference is that buoyant force is now a new force we have to draw into our force diagram and we have to calculate the volume of the object itself. So we will see over several different examples in this section what that looks like. So in this case, we have a two kilogram um, chunk of iron that is submerged underwater, okay? We can probably guess, and we can easily look at the densities, we can probably guess that the iron is denser and will sink if we cut that rope. And so the rope is helping, the rope tension plus the buoyant force are able to balance gravity downwards. We'll see this full example in a separate video. We have another example here where there's a person standing on a block of water so the person's weight um, is pushing down on the block of ice. I said block of water. We know block, block of ice. The person's weight is pushing down on the ice. The weight of this, the ice itself is pushing down too. And so the buoyant force has to balance both of those forces. So we'll see how that plays out in a separate example video as well. The same overall process, but a different combination of what forces are up and which forces are down. We will see our result for the ice block answer, and we'll have to kind of grapple with the fact of whether it makes sense on being a big number or a small number. The ice volume doesn't seem that big when we calculate it. We'll get that in the separate video. Um, but the mass is huge. We need 1,600 pounds of ice to hold up that person in the previous um, picture. Most of the big disconnect between our understanding of the volume and whether it seems big or small is that we really overestimate our personal space. So not like stay away from me personal uh, bubble kind of thing, but the physical volume of our um, bodies. If we look at any kind of contortionists or um, the Guinness Book of World Records for how many people can fit into a car or a phone booth or something, we realize that the volume of a person is not actually all that large. If we take a um, just kind of average person's mass, 70 kilograms, and we divide it by the density of water, because we are mostly made of water, we get the volume that a single person takes up, 0 0.07 cubic meters. So 14 people could quite uncomfortably fit into a cubic meter worth of space. What that also means, though, is that helps us understand why we haven't had to worry about buoyant force in any of the previous chapters. We didn't include the buoyant force in any of our chapter four or five problems. And we want to make sure we understand that that doesn't mean our problems were wrong. It means that the buoyant force from um, the air on solid objects is very small. So let's make sure we understand what that number, from the volume from the previous slide, what we mean by that. 
The buoyant force on a single person just from the air in the room around them is the density of the air times the volume of the person times G, 9.8. And when we plug in those standard numbers, we get less than one newton of buoyant force kind of helping you out. This particular person's weight of seven, uh, 70 kilogram person would be 686 newtons, um, 687 here, uh, close enough. It's a tiny difference, the buoyant force, which means we don't have to worry about including it. It is small enough that it won't matter in our problems unless we are somehow specifically asking for that number value. So in general, the big takeaway uh, moving forward in this chapter and a reminder from previous chapters is that we have been able to and will continue to be able to ignore the buoyant force from air on solid objects. If we are in the water, it definitely matters. If we have a balloon in the air, it definitely matters. But air on solid objects has a buoyant force small enough to be ignored. So the next example video that we will have a chance to um, look at and understand is this one here. Figuring out if we had a helium balloon and we attached um, a block to it by a string, how much could that block mass be for the balloon to be able to still float in the air? So the load mass would include um, all of the physical material. So the string, the balloon, like latex itself, but it does not include the mass of the helium. And we'll make sure to understand in the example video why we have to care about the helium mass separately. Now, when we get our number value, the balloon is gonna be able to hold up about one and a half kilograms. So I'm kind of giving away the answer, but we have that example video to look at to see where that answer comes from. So it seems like balloons really shouldn't be able to lift people or cargo or anything. But the key part to remember is anytime that we double the size, the side to side radius or diameter of a balloon, it means we are multiplying the volume by a factor of eight, which means that twice as big a balloon can hold 12 kilograms, twice as big again can hold over a person's uh, worth of mass. Hot air balloons don't even have as big a density difference as helium, and yet we are able to make these huge hot air balloons that can carry several different passengers. And back in the day when zeppelins used to be used more often, a zeppelin or blimp filled with helium could carry a several dozen people and cargo around um, or supplies, whatever we need to. But this one shown here with a little house to scale um, is over two football fields in length. And so we really do need this massive volume to be able to have the buoyant force be effective enough so that we can also carry cargo. So keep that in mind as we try to start coming up with these exciting balloon um, at home activities. Now, on the subject of balloons, we have another question. Okay, very different question than the first one we asked in chapter 11 uh, a couple of videos ago. Let's say that we have a cold air balloon and a hot air balloon. Which of these two balloons has a larger buoyant force acting on it? So pause the video if you need to and then vote. Okay. Now the key thing about the buoyant force and the most common mistake that I see students make is that the buoyant force density in that equation is the density of the surrounding fluid, the outside air. These two balloons have the same outside air, they have the same volume because I said they did, and then G is 9.8 for both, which means that the buoyant force is the same in both of these circumstances. We do not wanna get confused on what we mean by the density of the fluid. The big difference here is that the cold air is heavier, which means the amount of stuff we could carry by that balloon is very small. And for the hot air, the weight of the air itself, the lower density air inside, the weight is lower, which means that we can fill that balloon with more people or more cargo. There's a, there's a difference in how much we can balance um, the buoyant force with because of the difference in weight, but not the difference in the buoyant force. The buoyant force is just coming from, from the surrounding fluid. Okay, another question for us. 
let's say that we have a scale um, with a cup of water, okay? We put this glass of water on a scale and it reads a certain value. What will happen if I dunk my um, finger into the water? What will happen to the scale reading? Will it read this the more, um, a more mass? Will it read less mass? Will it read the same mass? Or, you know, if we were on campus, uh, I would have us vote no matter what, but we could vote no idea. So even at home, you can vote no idea. But think about it. Pause the video if you need to. Draw stuff if you need to. Talk it through with the plant next to you or your cat or your dog or the wall. All right. So the big thing to think about here is that when we press our finger into the water, there is now a buoyant force acting on our, on our finger. So the water is pushing on our finger. But Newton's third law means that when the water pushes on our finger, that means that the, our finger is actively pushing on the water. And so the scale will read more when we have our finger stuck into the water. The most common thing people say is that it's the same because they don't want to be tricked again um, like we did in the previous question, but we need to recognize that these aren't meant to be, you either read the question and know it or you don't. These are meant to be critical thinking questions and they take some effort to puzzle through. All right, now if we think about the setup of these different problems, and when you're watching this you probably haven't watched any of the example videos yet, and that's perfectly fine. What you will find, and hopefully you will make note of it as you go along, is that every single buoyant force problem has the same overall structure to it. We look at what forces are acting, we use our buoyant force formula to be more specific about what that buoyant force is, and for every object in the problem, we probably have to go from mass to volume, or from volume to mass, or we have to find the density. But we're using this idea from the first part of chapter one, uh, 11 that density is mass over volume as needed. So the last example from this section is one where we have a five kilogram block with a rope pulling it downwards. So right away, even before we um, finish up this lecture video and um, head to the examples, I want us to recognize something right away here. If that block is being pulled downwards by the rope, what has to be true about its density compared to the surrounding water? Think about that for a second. What do we know as kind of a step six check, but right at the beginning of the problem, what do we know about the density of this object compared to the density of water? So imagine what happens if we cut the rope. That block would now rise to the surface, which means hopefully what we recognized is that the density that we solve for in the problem is going to have to end up less than a thousand, otherwise it will not make sense to us. And that's a good check on our calculation to make sure we understand it. So we will see this example in its own separate video, just like um, the other chapters. So I will see you in the next video where we actually talk about one section out of chapter 12. So I will see you then.